Hi everyone, I'm gonna show you how to use both JWT and opaque access tokens in the same Spring Boot application. Along the way, I'll talk about the pros and cons of each. The app we are building will get the benefit of each type of token. OAuth access tokens are, by spec, opaque, meaning it's just some string. However, many OAuth providers will actually use JWTs for their access tokens. This is so common, in fact, that Spring Security actually supported JWT tokens before they supported opaque tokens. The main benefit of using a JWT is that they can be validated locally, whereas opaque tokens must be validated remotely in which you incur another HTTP call in your application, adding latency. However, the downside of this is that JWTs are basically stale. Any token you validate locally are stale, meaning that at some point after you were given the token, that token could have expired, the user could have logged out, been disassociated with it somehow. So if you're using JWTs, you wanna keep the lifespan short, say five minutes. That way, at most, the token is only stale for a few minutes. So I'm actually gonna build two apps today. So the first one is actually just gonna retrieve a token. Now this represents your application, whether it's a mobile app, a spa, maybe an API gateway, some sort of application that's in charge of getting an access token. And for this, I'm just gonna create a simple Spring Boot application and I'm gonna dump the access token on the screen. And then we'll talk about that. So I'm gonna use IntelliJ for this whole project. Uh, I would typically probably use command line or, or maybe start.spring.io, but to keep everything in this video, I'm just gonna use my IDE. So I'm gonna create a new project and I'm gonna use the Spring Initializer. I'm gonna use Java 11, but this whole same process would work with Java 8 as well, or newer. So I'm gonna call this token viewer. And it's I'm gonna use Maven Java and I'm gonna package it as a jar. And we're gonna leave all the other everything else to default. And for this, we want to use web. So Spring Web. And we're going to use OAuth client. Oop. OAuth client. And then hit next. I'm gonna create this project. Now that my IDE is finished loading. I'm gonna configure the application to use OAuth. So I'm gonna use Okta for this. The, the steps on how you get your configuration variables changes between vendors, but the theory and the types of configuration is all the same. I'm gonna use the Okta CLI to handle all of the configuration for me. So if I open up a terminal, you can install the Okta CLI by using Brew or Flatpak or Chocolatey. The links for all that will be in the description below. Once you have that installed, you'll need to register with Okta for a new account. If you already have one, you can use Okta Login. If you don't, you can just use Okta Register. And then it'll prompt you to enter some basic information. This will take a minute. You'll get an email verification code. Hop over to email and grab the, the code and you can just paste it in the terminal. Then follow the link and you can set up a password. Once you do all that, you're ready to create an application. So you can type Okta apps create and this will walk you through a little wizard. So I'm gonna call this token viewer and then we're gonna build a web application and we're gonna use Spring Boot, so number two. And this is the default callback URI that Spring Boot uses. So you can just hit enter again. So this will configure everything for you and it will write to your application.properties file. Now this file does contain a secret, so you don't wanna check that in. Spring offers a whole bunch of different ways to deal with secrets and files and, and manage across environments using environment variables, uh, Spring Cloud Config, other property files. There's a whole host of options. Um, for this example, I'm just gonna use a properties file. So we can open that up and you can see, take a quick look. So it has a client ID, a client secret and an issuer URI. So these were all um, just created for me 
And if you just create a password, you'll know that, that this is your Octa.org URL. For to give the, the backslash here, that's just an escape encoding for properties files. All right, so we're almost done with this little application here. We're gonna create a simple REST controller, otherwise it won't do anything. So I'm gonna create a little REST controller that's gonna dump the access token that my user gets to my browser. Now, this may look a little funny, so this is actually just a spring annotation. So I'm gonna use the current authorized client, which was Okta. Now this Okta actually lines up with the value from my properties files. If you remember, that Okta appeared here. So if you're using Google or Facebook, there'd be a different value here, but in practice, it's, it's the same. So once I have the client, I can get the current access token, and then I'll get the token value as a string. Just to make things easy, I'm gonna format it so I can cut and paste it into my terminal, and I'll have a token environment variable with the access token. So I'm gonna start this up. Then you can head over to your browser. I'm gonna use an incognito window, but you don't have to. So if I go to localhost 8080 slash token, it'll prompt me to log in. And this will be the same account that I just created. And there we go. This is, this is a very ugly application, but you can see it'll export a token and this is a JWT string. And we're gonna use the same value as the, the JWT and the opaque token. So if I copy that, get rid of my browser. Now that we have an access token, we're gonna to create a REST API that will consume that access token. So just as we did before, I'm gonna create a new project. Again, I'm gonna use the Spring Initializer. You could use start.spring.io or any other means you're comfortable with. And again, I'm gonna use Java 11. And we're gonna call this one two tokens. And again, Maven, Java, Java 11. Click next. Now for this application, we need um, Spring Web again. So Spring Web. And this time we're gonna do OAuth resource server. Typically your REST API is a resource server. You, you can access that with an API token or in our case, an access token. So you just click next and continue through here. Now, once you have everything, we're gonna have to make a couple small changes. So for one, we're gonna add another dependency. So open up our palm. Of course, if you're doing this with Gradle, process is basically the same. You grab your dependency. In our case, it will be this Nimbus dependency. So Spring Security uses Nimbus under the covers. And if you wanna use opaque access tokens, you need to include this dependency. Now we need to jump over to our application.properties. We're gonna configure a few things here. First, since we have two applications running, this one's gonna be running on port 8081. The default is 8080, which our other application is using. So we'll do server.port and just call it 8081. Next, I'm gonna turn on a little bit of logging to show you which outbound requests are actually being made. So this is logging level and we're gonna do org spring framework web client rest template. Oops. And then we're gonna set the level to debug. That will log every outbound call. And now of course we need to configure our OAuth application. So we're actually gonna configure both the JWT configuration and the opaque token configuration all at once, that way we don't have to come back to this. So the client ID and secret are gonna be the same as your other application, so you can copy and paste them over here, but the actual property ID is gonna be different. So let's start with that. I'm gonna use the type completion to find it for me. So it's OAuth resource server, so I have an ID and I have a secret. And then I'm also going to need one more value for this. So this is gonna be resource server, opaque token, and this is going to be the introspection URI. So if I grab the same values from my other application, 
you can see I have a client ID. And don't worry, I'm gonna delete these this client ID in secret uh, after I record this video so they won't be valid. Just make sure your secrets aren't leaked anywhere. So the client ID, the client secret. You also need the issuer. But in our case, it's not actually the issuer. This is the introspection URI. So you just need to take your issuer and then add slash v1 slash introspect to the end of it. And then to configure the JWT, basically the same thing, except we just need to configure the issuer for this one, which is the same URL we just had. I wanna remind you keeping secrets and files is not a great idea, so use caution here. So now that I have my properties configured, let's jump back over to our application. I'm gonna create a simple REST controller. It's a new Java class called simple controller. We'll annotate this with REST controller. And then I'm gonna use the tried and true hello world. Now you may laugh that I'm using a hello world example, but this allows us to keep the focus on what we're talking about, which is access tokens. Everyone knows how to make a hello world example. So I have one get request. So if I make a get request to slash, it's gonna return hello. And if I make a post request to slash with the included message, it's gonna say hello message. We'll get back to this in a minute, but I have a get and a post request. All right, so if I start up the application, if I did everything right, it should work. You can see one HTTP call has already been made, and this is to a well-known endpoint. This is going to allow Spring Security to fetch information about my OAuth IDP, such as where to find the keys for the JWTs that I'm using, etc. So if I go to a terminal, Remember, this is where you're going to need to paste in that ugly web page we made earlier, which was export token and then some giant JWT string. So you said enter. I'm gonna use HTTPy to make my request for me. It's very similar to curl. I find it a little more user-friendly, but you can, use, you can do the same thing with curl. So I'm gonna make a request to port 8081. Remember, we have two applications. The REST API is running on 8081. So if I just say slash, that's gonna make a get request. Now this request should fail because out of the box it requires security. So here we go, 401. So now if I add the authentication header, so authorization bearer token. And there we go. So there we have a hello world. If I go over to my log, you can see one additional request has been made. And that's to get the keys. So the first time a JWT is accessed, I need to get the public keys. So they're fetched and then they're cached. So no additional calls have been made. So if I clear this log and I make another request, you'll be able to see there's no new log entries. All right, so that's great. So that was JWTs. Now let's change this application to use an opaque token. I'm gonna create a new security configuration class. So once again, new class, I'm gonna call this example web security configure adapter. I know it's a long name, but bear with me. So this class is going to extend course the web security configuration adapter configurer adapter and then if I implement the methods whoops override method sorry we're going to override the configure HTTP security method and in this we're going to drop two lines this basically represents the application we just ran so all requests are authenticated. So authorize requests, any requests, authenticate them. And then this next line is going to configure JWTs. Now, since we just ran that example, this wouldn't show us anything new. 
So if I swap this out to opaque token, we're gonna start using the opaque token configuration. So once again, I'm gonna click run. Whoops. Of course, I need to annotate this as a configuration. And I'm gonna restart my application. Now hopefully this time I did it right. So you can see, once again, a request to the well-known endpoint was made. We still have J the JWT properties in there, but we're not gonna use them. So if I swap, if I go back over to my terminal and I make that same request again, again, I'll get a hello, nothing surprising there. But if I go over to my terminal, you'll see that a post request to the introspection endpoint has been made. Now again, if I clear all of this and I make that same request again, you can see that another request has been made. So as you can see, this adds latency into my application, but I know the token is not stale. So it's, there's potential that the JDBT could be stale. Now remember, security is always a balance of many things, right? So we have performance, usability, in the actual making sure we're locking down our resources. To get the best of both worlds, I'm gonna configure all my get requests to use JWTs and all my post requests to use the opaque token. So this way, anytime I'm gonna mutate data, so the idea being that post requests generally change data. So anytime data changes, I'm going to use the opaque token and any get requests, which are typically fast, I'm going to use a JWT. Now for your application, this may be different. Maybe you want to change resources based on paths instead of uh, request methods. That's up to you. This technique will work either way. So we need to add a few things to support this. First, Josh Cummings from the Spring security team put together an authentication manager resolver. Again, that's another mouthful, but that allows us to map some sort of resolution to which type of authentication we want to do. So let's create that class. So I'm gonna cheat, I'm gonna paste this in here so you don't have to watch me type this, this long thing. It's only a couple methods. Again, all of this code is on GitHub. I'll have links in the description below. But I'm gonna quickly walk through this. So first we have a map of authentication managers. So we have this request matcher, which is gonna match any servlet request to an authentication manager. So as we get down here, we'll see that when I call this resolve method, it's gonna loop through all my keys and see if any of them match. And if it does, it's gonna return the authentication manager that's mapped to that key. And then there's going to be a sensible default here. And I'll get to this in a second. All right, so now we actually need to make use of this class. So we're gonna jump back into our security configurer, which is pretty, pretty simple right now. And I'm gonna create uh, a custom authentication manager using this one we just created. So again, interest of time, I'm gonna use a live template here. If you're not familiar with live templates, uh, just Google IntelliJ live templates and it'll walk you through it. Basically, you can create little macros to do all the stuff for you, which are great for presentations or if you, if you find yourself doing the same thing over and over again. So what I've just created is an authentication manager resolver, which again uses that class we just created. And I'm gonna get a list of methods. So head, get, and options. So those are read-only HTTP methods. And if my request, my incoming request, is one of those types of methods, I'm going to associate it with JWT. We're gonna to get to this in a second. And then my default is going to be opaque tokens. So this is important here. So I want to fall back to the more secure option. So I only want to allow, you know, specific things to be the faster JWT option. But if any HTTP methods were added in the future, I would have to explicitly allow them. Again, this just allows the default option to be the more secure option. So I have a couple more live templates I can use. So I'm going to call this one JWT auth manager. And this is going to create an authentication manager 
based on the defaults that Spring uses. So if you look up the Spring source, this is essentially what they're doing. And the same thing with opaque. Uh, and of course, now I need to inject these values. So these are already available to me in the Spring context. I don't need to create them. So we'll just inject them. And forgive me, I'm going to use field injection here. Uh, I'm not a fan of field injection, but it works great for demos because it keeps the code more compact. So private JVT decoder. And the other one, auto wired private. All right, so hopefully there's no errors. This error is actually a false positive. Uh, there's only one of these. Uh, yes, of course, it does warn me about my field injection. But like I said, it's, it's okay. So now uh, I go back to my configure method and I'm going to remove this opaque line and I'm going to change this to the authentication manager resolver. And of course, that's the one we just created. So now we've linked everything together. Just to walk through this one more time, I have a custom authentication manager. Every time I get a head, get, or options request, I'm gonna validate that request with my JWT authentication manager. And for all other requests, I'm gonna validate them remotely using the opaque token. So there's one more thing I wanna do. So I mentioned before we're using JWTs and there's no real spec behind how a JWT is used for an access token. Now there is a spec behind the format and how to validate a JWT, but that's not use case specific. Every vendor that supports JWT access tokens has a recommendation of how you should validate them. Again, in addition to normal JWT validation. So if I hop back over to my application, I'm gonna create a bean. And again, just so you don't have to watch me type, I'm gonna speed this along. So this is, if I just create a bean with a JWT decoder, this will automatically get configured. Um, so Okta uses, a, again, a V1 slash keys endpoint. And all of this is basically the out of the box default configuration. So the timestamp configuration looks a little funny here because you, you would think that's baked in. It's not because if you have clock skew issues, you can actually add uh, a duration here to deal with an additional clock skew. So by default, you get a minute worth of clock skew. You could change that or lower it. What this means is that the server that created the JWT, that clock might be slightly different than the clock that your application is running on. Generally, everybody's using time servers, so there's the difference is minimal, but there is likely some sort of drift. So you can change that if you want or reduce it if you need to. And again, the issuer needs to be validated. And now this is where we get into the customization. So Okta recommends you validate the audience claim. And by default, if you create a new Okta account, it's APIs colon slash slash default. Per the JWT spec, this value could be a string or an array. And this just validates that and it has a nice little error message if it's wrong. Again, the details of this aren't super important for this, this demo, but I do want to point out each vendor will have some sort of recommendation and you should follow. And vendors like Okta, we have our own Spring Boot Starter that will do all of this for you. But for this video, I'm just using the out of the box Spring Security. So now if I start up my application again, and go back to our terminal, I'm gonna run my get request. And I'm gonna check my log. You can see one request to the keys endpoint. I think I'm gonna clear this out and I'm gonna make another get request. And there should be nothing in my log. Next, I'm gonna make a post request. So this is a form post and I have the message parameter here set to YouTube. So if I hit enter here, we should see hello YouTube. Great, so now the moment of truth is I should come back to my log and I should see a call to the introspect endpoint. 
Now going back over to my terminal again, making the same request, again makes an additional request out. Now we can do some back of the envelope sort of timing on this. So we can run the same command with time and we're gonna get whatever point six five seconds and if we do the same command with get it's probably I don't know a quarter second or so a third of a second so it's about twice as fast now of course this is in a very accurate performance test but if we run this a couple times you can see the numbers are fairly consistent and the other one will be slower the post again is about 0.7 seconds. One interesting thing to point out here is that there's more CPU time taken on the JWT example. And that's because there's some cryptographic validation happening on my machine to do this. Whereas if I send it remotely, there's some sort of validation happening there and my application is just sitting waiting for that response. So that's the application. Remember, there is no one size fits all for security. There's trades off between the amount of protection, the ease of use and speed. I'll have links to the original blog post this article was based on in the GitHub repository in the notes below. So if you liked this video and it was helpful and you want to see more like this, please click the like button and the subscribe button. That way we know you like the content and we'll create more videos like this. Thanks for watching.